I'm here now. Hotnewhiphop.com. DJ Who Kid. Um, when I first started, let me see, when I first got the spark to do hip-hop, I lived on uh, Springfield and 111th Road, which is kind of popular because it's the center of uh, Hollis and the corner of, uh, well, a couple of blocks down is Linden Boulevard. Then you had Springfield and you had uh, Little Jamaica. In this area, uh, next door to me was, uh, I mean, it's crazy, L. Cool J lived on Linden Boulevard. So I used to see the skinny version of L Cool J walk by my house like every day. So that's one spark right there. Yeah, that's pre-steroidic, uh, uh, whatever, energy shake motherfucker L Cool J. He was very skinny. Uh, he used to be at, uh, he used to play handball at 34 Park where uh, another gentleman I used to see all the time smoking all kinds of drugs, uh, Russell Simmons. He was at 34 Park before he got his investment from gangsters to start uh, his label. He was very heavy in drugs at uh, the the chess table. There's, there's a famous ch- uh, there's a famous chess table at 34 Park where Russell Simmons was at doing heavy drugs, and uh, he was cool. He wasn't like a crackhead or nothing, but he was very a cool drug head. And then to the, to not to mention 111th Road, I live next door to E Money Bags. And, I, and uh, Tall Stretch. So Tall Stretch was a producer slash rapper from uh, Live Squad back in those days. Uh, my young ass used to always see uh, two other Sparks coming up the block. Tupac, when he was with uh, Digital Underground, and countless other rappers, Nas, Biggie. Everybody went to Tall Stretch's crib to get beats. So to end all the Sparks, DJ Clue lived on Murdoch with DJ Envy. So I had these guys that I always would see and interact with where I would uh, observe Clue, who was like my, uh, well, we both went to Queensborough College, so we both were in class, and one day he was like, I'm quitting, I'm going to um, work for Jay-Z. So I thought he was bullshitting. We both were in lab or some shit, I don't know, I was cutting a frog in half or some stupid shit, and then the motherfucker was like, yo, I quit. I'm going to work for Jay-Z. So I thought he was lying. And then literally, he, I saw him in a BMW 325i, which is like, it's kind of old school, but back in, back in the 90s, that 325i was like hot. And Clue came on the block with it and shut us down. And he really started uh, interacting with the whole Rockefeller crew. So I was like, what the fuck? Uh, I got close with Envy's homies. Uh, shout out to Splash. Um, we we kind of like uh, I mean it, it it was not planned. It's, it's, it went from like lying to stealing to hiding. Then the fame came because Queens DJs always had exclusives uh, illegally. You know what I'm saying? Like we 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 would get it from anywhere, any label, any studio. We would pay for it. We don't care if it's unfinished. We would still leak it. That's why Clue had the big. Uh, Beef with Biggie when he went on Hot 97, he leaked one more chance. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't even finished. It was just a song and a hook. So the adrenaline rush of leaking an artist's record and them looking for you, like for weeks and couldn't and can't catch you, uh, kind of like started our career. Like that's really how it all started. And even on this block, which I'm gonna keep saying, 111th Road, 50 Cent, who was known as Boo Boo, was on the block beating up drug lords that owed him money. So uh, randomly, I would see him come up in a, 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 baby, a baby ninja. He always had like a motorcycle, baby ninja pull over. Everybody knew it was him. It was like Debo. It was like watching fucking Friday and shit. He'll jump off the bike, beat everybody in the corner. And I don't know if they paid him or not, but I did see the beatings and stuff. And he would literally just get on his uh, ninja and just take off. So this is like maybe 10, 10 or 12 years before, for some reason, I'm going to be touring with this guy. So imagine, like, you see somebody, like, 12 years before anything. I was just a dumb Haitian kid hanging on my grass Look, because, you know, I had a curfew, so I couldn't leave my house. So I would just sit on the grass and watch 
on some 227 shit. I would just watch what's going on on the block. So this is, this is what's going on all day. So if you see like a random guy, 50 saying he was booboo, he was really big, he was like 300 some pounds, he was beating it. So I would never think that maybe 12 or I don't know how many years, 13 years, whatever, that I would be doing arenas with this guy that's just like in front of me beating some drug dealers up. So that's why I, this fate thing is crazy. But like I said, the lies kind of created my career because back then, you know, records were so expensive. So I would lie like crazy. Like, I, I may believe I was touring in Japan, China. Like, I make fake flyers, fake club flyers and stuff. So I would leave the flyers and all the labels. And Def Jam was one of them. And Russell Simmons, I knew it was easy to trick Russell Simmons because he lived in Queens. He's from Queens. I lived in Hollis. So those key words right there kind of, like, made my lie more official. So he wanted to know, who the fuck is this guy from Queens touring in Japan? I know he's not going to call Japan. I know he's not going to call the clubs there. The flyer was official. So whenever I would come up, I would interact with this guy called Chris Lighty, or Peter Chris Lighty. He was, uh, I guess he was Russell Simmons' assistant at that time, the old Def Jam on Varick. And then I would interact with him or Mike Lighty, which is the younger brother who also worked at Violator, which came later on. But records were so expensive back then, I had to lie to get the records. It was like... Four or five hundred bucks just to get wax. So fake flyers. I'm touring overseas. Russell Simmons like, who the fuck is this guy? My first lie got me to interact with him. He knew I was from Hollis. I knew I used to see him in 34 Park. So he kind of like believed everything, and then I became friends with him. So he never checked up on me to see if I really toured Japan or I really. He didn't give a fuck. The fact that I was from Queens and I and I lived near Hollis on 215th Hollis. In Springfield, he he that 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 made it cool. So once I got in with him, all the other labels came in line because you know Russell Simmons was the the god of uh, the music industry. So my lies got me to like interact with like Hype Williams, uh, who else? Uh, you know Chris Lighty, of course, became like an executive after a while. But my 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 introduction to him from Russell Simmons made our relationship secure. So I learned all the secrets from Chris Lighty about everybody else from, uh, I mean, you name it, uh, whether it's uh, Jimmy Iovine, uh, I mean, all the big execs I got to meet from Chris Lighty. So I can't say that my career was created like because I planned it. It's all from like this action, that action, this lie, that lie. And then it came to a point where the lies started transforming into reality where I didn't have to lie anymore. Because, you know, the lies I did is because I created those lies because I know the industry. Learning from Chris Lighty, he taught me the lies of hip-hop, how people were, like, fabricated about how they were living. Uh, nowadays, you could use Instagram, you could use social media, and you could be, like, the, the richest motherfucker on the planet. So he did the intro. So once he did the intro, DJ Who Kid Puff Daddy, first lie. I am Puff Daddy's DJ, motherfucker. So I toured Canada. I did much music. I bought a Sean John fucking suit. I did every TV show. They were like, this is Puff Daddy's DJ. And then uh, one day, uh, uh, Harv Pierre, he had them satellite TVs and shit. Because, you know, back then, it was, you have to be rich to have, like, a satellite TV where you could watch channels from all over the world. So he just happened. This is what I call fate. He happened to turn on much music. And here I am on much music. Puff Daddy's DJ, and then they're interviewing me about Puff, and I'm making up all kinds of dumb shit. But the fact that Harv Pierre is Haitian, he let that slide, and number one, he thought it was amazing that I toured like six cities in Canada. I've never been to Calgary, I've never been to Regina or Edmonton or Montreal, but only because I lied because Puff Daddy introed my tape. And then I took it further, when you steal songs, I put his intros in front of the songs, which led to realist niggas which is uh 50 cent and biggie so for me i already stole the record i didn't know where it came from it's an original <laughs> it's an original biggie verse and i was like yo fuck it put puff on the intro he did the drop on the tape so if you ever hear the original song it's uh shadyville entertainment bad boy collaboration but that's from the mixtape but by me putting it in front of the biggie song which we stole and nobody never heard it. Even Puff didn't hear it. That's why even Puff. So Puff went berserk at the office, by the way. He flipped chairs and was trying to get me. But I was smart at Hot 97 because I would play it literally before I leave. So the last 10 minutes of the show, I would debut it, wear Flex and 
uh, Angie Martinez, enough. Everybody's going crazy because they never heard the Biggie song. But at the same time it's playing, I'm on the elevator leaving because everybody's going to come up to the station, try to grab my ass, try to find out where I get it. And by then, I'm on my way, I'm on tour, he didn't catch me. Uh, I'm out of here. So the only time, the, the next time he caught me is when fucked up about the whole situation. I had to do a Saturday Night Live with 50, and you have to go do rehearsal at SNL. So he knew I was up there. He knew I had to do rehearsal. I guess he called somebody to find out when the 50 Cent rehearsal is. And my dumb ass, I saw him on the left of my, like he, I don't know how the entrance is in now, how, how the entrance is in SNL now, but back then when you rehearse, you could tell like where the group come in like the fans where they, where they would come in, but Puff was in the entrance where the fans would come in and I could see him like looking around. So when I saw Puff, I automatically like walked fast. I'm not gonna say I ran, I don't remember, I don't recall what I did, but I know I walked extra fast to 50 Cent's dressing room because I know if I'm in there with 50, he's not really gonna do nothing with me. But I think he, he intercepted me at the tee before I got to the room and he had me, this is so funny. He had me in a headlock, like a cool headlock. It wasn't like no dangerous shit. So he he headlocked me into 50's room. So 50's like chilling. I don't know. I think he was drinking like some energy shake or some stupid shit. I don't know. He was eating, I don't know, broccoli, a broccoli sandwich or some dumb shit. I don't know. He was on some health bullshit. And then he sees, he looks up and he sees like me getting headlocked in by Puff. And then he starts laughing and shit. Cause he, I guess he already knew what it was all about. So Puff is like, "Yo, where'd you get this Biggie song?" I saw me. I was like, "Nah, you know, it's cold to the streets. You know, DJs ain't supposed to snitch on where they get any song from." So I'm trying to tell Fifty. First of all, Fifty did the record, which is even worse. So he's part of this fucking robbery shit, but he ain't going that fifth. You know what I'm saying? But he just wants to know where, I, cause he never heard the Biggie verse. So he just wants to know where I got it from. So I'm like, nah, I can't. So 50's like, just tell him, man. Wait, just tell him where you got it from, dogs. So I'm just like, fuck. So I was like, uh, uh, I can't really, I can't really. Uh. So I'm just like still in the headlock. And then once I, I, I think I screamed out, uh, what's, the, what's those producers' names? Shit. I forgot the producers back then that Puff used to deal with. Shit. No. They were under Columbia. Damn. Uh, track masters, yeah. So I shouted out track masters, and he went. You know, those were supposed. To, I don't know how how cool they were. Maybe they were having espresso every Sunday. I don't know how cool they were. He went crazy, and he ran out SNL and left me like like in the days. Like it was gonna fit these laughing, and then uh, yeah, that started my 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 who kid uh, terroristic leaking shit. But I, I learned from like MV and DJ Clue, they, they're the reasons why I got into mixtapes, you know, because if it wasn't for them, that kind of like started my career. And then from there, I just got creative with it. I got celebrities to host it, I got everybody in the industry, like I said, Hype Williams, Lil X, I kind of like got cool with like everybody that had to do with anything with music, host the tape, because DJs weren't doing that. So there should be a new name for the music that's out now. It shouldn't really, shouldn't really be called hip hop, and I respect the fact that they're popular and they're getting paid, that, you know, everybody's getting paid. I, I DJ festivals and I, I rock all the new guys. I respect that. And then it, and then it kind of like opened the doors for me because I'm an old motherfucker and I'm still in front of 20,000 motherfuckers every week, you know. And then to, to convert from like where there was no hip hop, because I'm old school. I was around when I was listening to fucking Here Comes the Rain Again and just, I was watching Video Music Box to like watching Grandmaster Flash at a park. Like I was there. Like I was there when I when Run DMC was in the studio. Like I was there. Like me and Rakim, I you know Big Daddy Kane to like the Wu Tangs to uh, where it switched to the hardcore the NW. Like I went through all uh, hip hop transitions to now where I'm doing EDM now. Now, now I can rock trap. I could do and you know Tiesto's my homeboy. Calvin Harris, like, you know, me and Marshmallow, I knew Marshmallow for years. It's funny, I didn't even know who he was until he took the shit off. I was like, oh shit, I know this nigga, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, it's funny how the hip hop shit's interconnected where it's like 30 years of transitions and I'm still here, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's cool.
Yeah, I was uh, I was a clown comedian. Uh, ugly people were number one in my when I used to go to when I when I was in school. I was ugly too, so it was easy to draw myself. So then I was like, yeah, there's a lot of ugly people in this school. So what I would do is every class I would find whoever was ugly, who's fat or skinny, whatever. It didn't matter as long as you're ugly. It's hard to draw like people who are like like sexy girls and pretty girls. Hard to draw them, but if you're goofy, your nose is fucked up or whatever, I would draw all the teachers and I would draw like. Uh, my peers or students in my lab class, and I would create like comic books for my school. And the comic books got really popular where it would go from my high school, which was St. John's Prep, to like aviation, all the other like high schools nearby, because I would actually put like, it was kind of like the first world star type thing going on in the, in the 80s and shit, because, yeah, because if, uh, if, if there was a fight after school, I would reenact it in the comic book. If a teacher if a teacher molested a kid, I would put that in a comic book. If the teacher if the principal is a piece of shit, I'll draw him as a piece of shit. Or you know like everything would, that occurred in in like the current three four weeks would be in a comic book, and a comic book would be handed around the whole school until it somehow comes back to me, or it don't come back to me. It came to the point where the students were copying them, and just like making copies, and then it became thicker and thicker when other high schools and I had like uh, Decepticons come to the school and fuck us up. I, I had that in the school. Parents was picking students up, taking them out. Like it was like it, it was kind of like more of like I don't know what the hell was going on in my mind. I was, but if you look at the comic book, it's a, it's a lot of my friends hit me on Facebook. Yo, I have one of your original comic books that you did, and it had like mad like it's kind of like I don't know, kind of like a cool yearbook where you can see what and the, and then the comic like I, I would draw people. It would look like them. And it would be shit that they went through. It, some of it is fucked up. Like, you know, like, bitches getting caught sucking dick and it's them. Or, you know, you get susp- all kinds of fucked up stories, you know, but it came out, like, really good, you know what I'm saying? But I, I was more of, like, a, I don't know. I, was, I, I always wanted to do graffiti, and I always wanted to, like, uh, be one of those guys. But I was always too pussy to go out there and spray shit up and get locked up. So I kept it in high school. I never really had setbacks. I mean, if you're looking at monetary shit, maybe there was a, there was moments I didn't have a job, but I always had a job. I, I went from DJing for uh, my first artist I DJed for was uh, Juvenile. That's how I got. That's how I was with Cash Money, and I got that from trying to get like South artists on tapes. So New York, as you can see, the East Coast was killing it. It was like the biggest shit. You couldn't fuck with us at all. So nobody gave a fuck about the South, West, who cares? Everything was East. But when I sold tapes, I wanted to sell more tapes. So what I did is I flew down South and I got the TIs and the Trick Daddies and I got freestyles and songs from all those artists. But one artist who was juvenile, uh, he was like, yo, why don't we do a tape? Let's do a mixtape. And then he just kidnapped me for, it went from me being there for a week to like DJing like a tour with him. And he introduced me to uh, <laughs> this thing called the uh, replay machine because his uncle was the DJ. He was like, yo, why don't you just hang with me for like weeks? Let's do this tape. Yeah, hey, by the way, here's Lil Wayne. This is Lil Wayne right here. Lil Wayne's like maybe 14 or some shit. Here's Young Buck with his 8XT looking like he's going to rob me and shit. And then uh, that's where I met, you know, Baby, Manny Fresh. And so I was, I, I kind of like was, I, I did a... Uh, uh, Lil Wayne's first mixtape when he was with them little kids and shit. It was like 80 of them. It was like crazy. All these rapping. And I think uh, Kid Kid was, that's when I first met Kid Kid. But Kid Kid was like 14 with him too. So it's kind of like it went from that whole cash money, which was so weird, me coming from Queens. But it doesn't make, it, it makes sense if you see like Drama who left Philly and then went down south and now he does it. It, 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 it kind of like makes sense if you look at it in that perspective. But I ran from cash money. And then I, I did that stint for like a year and change. And that's before the lies when I was Puff DJ. So lying with Puff DJ, now I'm with uh, Juvenile. And then I went from Juvenile to CNN. All that shit went from CNN and then CNN. I toured with them a little bit. Then 50 Cent started coming in. He got shot the fuck up. And then that's where Sean Money called me. He was like, yo, we need a DJ. So I was still with Nori. And uh, at that time... I think it was like a paid thing. I don't know. Because back then, you know, DJs weren't getting paid that much. So 50 Cent was like, yo, I'm not interviewing shit. 
if he's related to you, Sha, bring him over here. And then we we'll could check him out and we're gonna hire him. I got there and then I, I not even an interview. They were just asking me some questions. They gave me a vest and they were like, yo, whoever you're with, who gives a fuck? You married, who gives a fuck? You're gonna be gone for 300 days. Like, we're not coming back home. So we just did like 300 shows after that, and then that is, it's been like 50 cent ever since. Like, but Nori was like, damn, man, you took my DJ. You, you know, you took, I think he had Scarlett at that time. I don't know if he was dating Scarlett. I don't know if he was dating Scarlett or whatever, but Scarlett went to G Unit. So Nori was like, God damn, nigga, you took my fucking DJ. You got my, got my bitch over there. Like, 50 was like taking everything. Like, I was like, what the hell? And then ever since then, it's just been, you know, my mixtape somehow got to uh, to Paul Rosenberg and uh, his lawyer at that time. I forgot his name. Shit, that's fucked up. That's like my boy, too. Fuck. He's going to kill me when he sees this interview. He's like, well, Paul Rosenberg, partner in crime, who managed uh, Eminem at the same, uh, you know, at, at that time, that's how he got uh, 50 Cent of the Future. So that first tape... I mean, I mean, I just did drops. They gave it to Paul. Paul gave it to M. M was like, "Yo, we signed a 50. and we're all like just bullshitting, like, because back then I had a Benz. Everybody had like nice cars, but Fifty had a hoopty. The Fifty didn't even have no money yet. And then we just heard on the radio, Eminem is looking for Fifty. Want to sign Fifty? And then ever since then, it just was like, Pshaw. and then that's it. It's all fate, though. That's what I like about this hip hop thing because you can't really plan out a career. You know, if Fifty didn't get shot changes style of rap because he i've known him way before you know when he was uh doing his other albums and stuff like you know power of a dollar he was so different where when the bullets went through his mouth it switched up his whole lingo and his uh i guess his his technique so everything is fate there's no there's not going to be anyone in hip-hop that's going to come and do an interview and say yo this is how i planned it and this is how i mapped it out that, that, that's, that's always been, and then even now, my, my career is not over yet because now I'm like, I'm forcefully doing EDM and trap and I'm touring like, I went from like all this and I tore a Waka Flocka who's like, I did like 128 frat parties last year, which is like insane. Like, I never thought they like my old ass, first of all, I'm old as fuck, fuck I'm doing some college shit and I'm killing that shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I guess the power of music and the way you put it out there, uh, you can't go wrong. You know, my end game will be radio, of course. When I'm like 80 and shit, I'm hanging with Ted Koppel. He's fucking Ted Koppel ashes in my fucking. Super. I'm just, I'm just gonna fucking have that as the end game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I came up DJing, I was, I was a security guard. Shout out to all my security niggas out there in them boxes. You know what I'm saying? Doing them crossword puzzles. You know what I'm saying? And not checking shit. For seven dollars an hour, you know. Shout out to y'all. I, I love you guys. You know what I'm saying? But I was security guard, and I, I would dub my tapes in my booth at that time. So I used whatever job I had. You know, I would just like bring the tapes in and just because we had machines back then. So if you had to copy like five thousand tapes, you can't. You know, I didn't have. You know, the crews came later when I was making more money. But in the beginning, I was literally like at like a nine hour shift. That's nine hours of dub mad tapes. So if you know a lot of security guards back then, I don't know if they're watching this interview, they're going to be like, yeah, who kid? Sometimes I wouldn't take a lunch break. I'd be like, no, because I got to dub all these tapes. Because I, I, I don't know if I should talk about this, but I had a DJ Clues like dubbing machines, but he never knew. You actually would be the first people to, to get this interview. <laughs> so uh, yeah, DJ Clue, uh, I think he was dubbing like 20,000 tapes. So he always, he always would wonder why his heads were always, like, fucked up in the machines. So back then in those double machines, uh, I think they were called 360 or whatever, it would cost, like, 1500 bucks to change the heads because the machines were, like, four grand each. I ain't buying that shit. So what I would do is Clue would dub 20000 and then I would sneak in his crib and just take, like, all three machines. And because I know he's out, he's dropping the tape, collecting his money, living La Vida Loca or whatever. So he ain't gonna come back for a month and change. All I need is the machines for one or two days. And then now, he just copied 20,000 tapes. Now here comes my 5,000 little tapes added on. So he's basically copying 
25 to 30,000 tapes a month, but didn't even know. And I don't know how much Envy was copying, because Envy copied, back then Envy was copying Clues tapes, so I'm sure he took advantage and copied with his. So let's just say one machine was copying like 40,000 tapes a month, and he never knew about it. For like years, like eight years of using his machines, he never knew. So he knows now though, and it's too late. The mixtape shit is the game is over. Everything is free. Everything is on online download. So, but he always would wonder why is my why were my heads fucked up? But I had always had clues machines, and they were like at my job when I worked at, at JFK, like in like at post, like. People were like, yo, why does it say DJ Clue on there? I'm like, yo, man, don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, that that that's one of the funniest shits right there. Like, I, I never, you know, I never even told Clue this shit. Ever. Well, he knows now. And I'm going to say 50 Cent, I want to get beat up. But 50 Cent is my the favorite best artist ever. Man. And first of all, I'm not going to DJ for nobody else. So any, anything you see me doing now is a collabo. Like, I'm never going to be nobody's DJ ever again. I'm just going to be, like, 50 Cent is, that's it. I am 50 Cent's DJ. It's kind of like joining the mob. Like, you can't get the fuck out. So, regardless, I'm always, like, G-Unit. Always, like, that's my DNA. You know what I'm saying? So, 50 Cent, I've seen it all. Met, like, Nelson Mandela. Hung out with freaking terrorists and shit. Like, we did, I DJed for fucking uh, Gaddafi. You know, I, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have met like half the leaders of the world. I wouldn't have met like so many A list actors. Like you know, you hang with De Niro. You can't just leave here and just hang with De Niro. Like I'm on set with De Niro talking about rims and and bitches and bullshit. And, like who does that? But only because of my link with Fifty. Fifty is like kind of like a global uh, threat, like a like like a machine that kind of like helped a lot of my career. So. I've I've seen a hundred thousand with him. I've seen like a five hundred to a hundred thousand fans with him, and he don't give a fuck. If there's like eighty people out there, he's gonna still perform like a full show. Me, I'd be like, nigga, let's do the ten minute shit. Fuck out of here, no, nah, we doing the whole shit. Like he, yeah, he's very serious about anything that has to do with uh, his career or hip hop. Like he, it don't matter. Ten fans, he's going in. You know what I'm saying? And then of course Eminem. Uh, I can't say I DJed for Eminem, but coming on before him, I think he's the first artist I've seen, I don't know, maybe 300,000 people. Like, So when you see like 300,000 people, like all these guys jumping up and down at these concerts, they got like 10,000, 20,000. Uh, There's a difference when you see 300,000 humans with their hands up and it's like, I don't know, I it's just, it's just crazy. Like it's, it's a feeling that I'm never gonna forget. But yeah, that that, that got to be it. Fifty Cent guaranteed. Radio is something that I, I didn't think would happen either. Like I said, fate. I just uh, back then, I, I, while I was stealing shit, I wanted to get cool with uh, Stretch Armstrong, who did Hot 97. Uh, he had a show on Sundays where he would play like exclusives. So he was kind of like more connected with the DJ. He had Jay Z sleeping over at his crib and. All kinds of crazy shit. So I thought that he would be one cool Jewish motherfucker to hang with. You know what I'm saying? So I would give him exclusives because he was he, he's not the type that's going to be out there getting shit. People would bring him stuff, but then he didn't understand, like, stolen stuff. Like, I'm like, yo, I got Nas' album and it's not out yet. He'd be like, so, <laughs> so he will play dumb with me. And then uh, my job was to bring him, like, a few exclusives that he could get away with murder. So he'll play it on his show. And I would get like barely one shout out and barely maybe 30 seconds on radio. Yo, what up, man? And that's it. Like, I, I didn't even talk. I didn't even like click a joke. And I was happy with that. Because back then, like, that's why I always tell people it's a privilege to be on radio, how powerful it is and how it could just like change your career or, or blow you up. Now everybody's so fucking spoiled. I want to talk about certain people I know, but... They just don't understand the power of radio. Like, there's not there's not many flexes out there. There's not many like Ebros. There's not many you know big boys. There's not many. You you could say like ten top radio jockeys off the head. There's there's not thousands of radio. It's hard to get on a ill show and you're popping. It's harder to be a DJ almost on the radio than a rapper. And yeah, exactly. So. 
Stretch Armstrong gave me the opportunity where I had 30 seconds every every Sunday. So that was good enough for me to sell tapes. You know, I had my Lambo downstairs. I didn't give a fuck. As long as that, I got a little shout out, that was good. Because back then there was no Instagram, no Twitter, no social media. So that 30 seconds led me to a situation where the World Trade Center bombing occurred. And then his girl at that time was holding both of his pugs. And she lived next door to the to the bombing shit. So first plane hit or whatever, and she ran out. She's running with the, both dogs trying to escape. And me and him, we were actually doing a mixtape for Puff, another tape that had nothing to do with whatever trouble I was going through. But I was doing another tape with Puff, but I finished at 8 something, like 9 o'clock, so I could fucking uh, avoid the traffic. So uh, by the time I got home, the whole road to trees, I saw the shit come down for the first time. So I was like, oh, shit. So I'm thinking, oh, shit, Stretch. Is Stretch dead? Like, cause his studio is like right across from the World Trade Center. So I'm trying to call Stretch. Trying to, I'm trying to call him, but he ain't picking up. So I'm thinking he's out of here because that shit came down. And then, you know, that shit came all the way down to Canal Street from, you know, Wall Street. So fast forward, I find out he's alive, but he's crying. He's going crazy. <laughs> So his girl ran out with the pugs, and one of the pugs jumped off her arm and ran off. So she's like, fuck that. Yo, I, don't know, I don't know if she said fuck that, but the world trade, yo, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to come down. She's just running. The plane hit. She's running. She leaves. She tells him, yo, one of the dogs is missing. So the World Trade Center came down. Dog's still missing. So fucking, he was so traumatized, he couldn't do his show that Sunday. So... I took over, which here comes the opportunity right here. I think I took over like one or two times until they actually found the dog. They had like a, a center where all the surviving dogs were at. And his dog had no, that's why I call his dog the devil dog because all the other dogs were missing legs, they were bleeding, fucked up. His dog had no injuries, just dust. So the dog survived the whole shit. So I see, so I'm watching him on TV literally kissing his dog on Eyewitness News. Like, Stretch is like, like, he's in love. Like, it was like, and then that ended my little stint. But that one thing of me just being on the show, uh, Mr. C and Flex and Tracy at that time, who was the program before Ebro came on, was like, yo, this guy's a funny dickhead. You know what I'm saying? So then at that time, Clue was moving to power. And then it all made sense. So they put me in clue slot on Mondays, and then I have my own show. Mm, probably Willie Nelson is weird. That, that was like one of my all-time favorite. Like he talked about groupies. He still gets them when he's 90. Like he's full of stories. Still alive. I, the first thing I told him, I was like, yo, nigga, you still alive. He was like, hell yeah, motherfucker. Like, it's like, you, you got to like, yo, it, when you bring that human connection to anything, then it becomes like a classic situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of other shows out there that's popping. I respect all of them. But they got, like, machines and fucking, you know, creative marketing. And then they, they put out, like, it's kind of like whatever they do is pop. I just want my shit to be like, holy shit. Like, I'm not going to get this nowhere else. That's why I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm not promoting who's on a show no more. If you don't tune in, then that's your loss. You know, like, I'm not doing that shit no more. Eminem is on the show. So if I have Eminem... On my show, people expect me to go super crazy with him. I know him. And I know how to interview him. But, you know, I can't, really, I can't get, like, all kinds of crazy shit out of him because he's saving that for his marketing. Eminem is a, a, a kind of, like, he's very, like, strategic the way he markets his shit. And there's certain info. He don't need it to be out. And he always tells me, fuck you, man. I'm not telling you shit. So <laughs> that's another thing, too. But I, I just want fans to know, like, you know, if you don't tune in on the weekends, you, it's your loss. But it's just like, it's just random, like how I've learned to make something impossible possible and make it entertaining at the same time. Um, Right now, uh, I, I know my podcast, everybody's annoying me to do one, so I'm definitely going to do a Hollywood Shuffle podcast. So that's next on the list uh, uh, of me getting it cracking. Uh, my marketing company has always been here. I've helped like all the rappers you see jumping up and down on stage, one way or another. They use me for either mixtapes or marketing, uh, creative marketing, trying to make them look cool. So I kind of like mastered that uh, that whole aspect of like, and then people pay for that shit. Fuck it. I take fives and tens. You know, I'm trying to 
hide my money from the government. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I, you know, I've done, if, you, if you see, I've done like 600 tapes, and you you're like, I mean, I don't have to brag or say anything because I've done almost everybody's shit or have some kind of history behind everybody. You know what I'm saying? So if you if you go to like, so all right, one is that you go to the UK and you see a guy like Giggs is popping. I did Giggs first mixtape. I did Skepta. I did Tiny Tempa. I did like 70% of the UK artists because I didn't want to be just known as an American mixtape guy. So I went out there, and then when you DJ those clubs in the UK, you see that their own artist is killing the club. So if nobody from America is calling them, I want to be the first one. And now when you see I do all their tapes and you see a guy like Drake, all you need is another big artist to come there and open the doorway. Because I, I kind of like did the body of work. So you, you got Drake hanging with Skepta. I did his shit. You got Drake big enough gigs. I did his shit. It all comes in full circle. All roads lead to, and it don't have to be me. It could be like, uh, it could be drama. It could be like, all these roads lead to the mixtape DJ. You know what I'm saying? So like, I, well, it's, I don't think there's a difference in the DJ compilation because they're still being used as a, uh, as a marketing tool where it's, it's just, it's, the difference is, is how they're put out there. But if you see like DJ Khaled, like he's very successful with it. Like DJ Clue is the first one to go platinum. You know what I'm saying? But we're really human billboards promoting songs. So there's really no difference. It's just the way uh, depends on what machine you got to put it out. Whoever you hang with, you hang with Jay Z. Can't go wrong. I mean, Khaled is doing the same shit Clue did back in the days. Jay Z is a billionaire now, so it's going to be the different uh, format. But there's really no difference. And then I, I like like I like seeing that shit. At the end of the day, um, the DJ provides that blanket or, or kind of like a, a, a vest as I would say, from uh, protection from failure. Because if you put out a single and it's DJ whoever featuring you, if it doesn't go right, you can always blame the DJ and you have a second chance to put out another single. So we, we, we take the hit for it becoming a hit, but we also take a hit for it becoming a whack song. But at the end of the day, it doesn't affect us because the DJ is not considered like, oh shit, I'm never buying this DJ shit. Because the DJ, the outlets, it's like hundreds of doors for the DJ to do shit. So you can have like 30 failures and 10 hits here, it don't matter. Like we will take the hit. So I like that, like, you know, and then uh, it keeps me fucking relevant and everybody else out there, I'll tell you that. Oh, we're cool, everything is like, I mean, it's like personal now, like he's, he's worried about my ex-wife issues and, and you know, we always talk about what lawyers they get and shit like that. So he's like a, a I, with him is like more of a kidnapping thing when it comes to music. So uh, he's busy doing power and movies and shit like that. So we don't have like uh, I don't know. Everybody thinks that because I'm G unit, I have to always hang with him. Like when we hang together, it's like love. Everything is cool. Uh, music wise, I just gotta kidnap his ass, and I will. We already spoke on uh, on a, a few. Well, he said he got a few songs already done, and they're in pieces. So all I got to do is just go in there and do what we used to do. And then I just got to like either steal the shit and risk my life from getting beat up by his ass because he is a professional boxer on the low, uh, which means he has deadly hands. So I got to really think about what I'm going to do. But he do got a lot of songs in pieces. And uh, he did, uh, he, he did uh, I think he has a joint with Gucci Man coming out soon. So uh, I'm definitely going to steal that shit. But uh, yeah, he has like uh, 20, at least 20 some songs, like in pieces. And he's dealing with if he should leak it now, the, the, the timing of every song in comparison to what's going on out there. So he's, he's comparing about what people are listening to, or should he just say, fuck it, I don't care what people are listening to. That like Kendrick Lamar shit, he don't give a fuck about what's going on out there. My advice now is uh, you, you're a lucky motherfucker because there's so many uh, opportunities, so much social media shit. You could put money, invest. Instead of buying a chain, invest in your Facebook. Invest in your, uh, get, a, get, get, a, get some nerdy white kids that know how to manipulate all that shit online and pay them 500 bucks a month. Have them work for you. Everybody from Wiz Khalifa to Kendrick to 
they all have these cool little nerdy white kids that run their social media. So get some college grad or some college kid that's just like a fan of your music and he'll do all kinds of amazing shit for you. You know what I'm saying? And then at the end of the day, you got to be... You gotta you, you gotta be full 360 with it. You gotta be somebody that people want to be. I'm not saying everybody want to be me, but uh, I ain't gonna be wearing no whack shit. I ain't gonna be fucking. You know what I'm saying? Like this 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 loser shit. You shouldn't be doing. Like try your best to get in fashion because full 360 now is not just the music. It's you know who you hang with, fashion, uh, your peers. Like you know. Uh, your style, and find two, three artists. One of them is going to blow. You know, like I said, you in this interview, you heard me, I've, I've bounced from, like, so many artists where it led me to my final artist, which is 50. But I had so many experiences, and, you know, I, I understand the whole shit. I don't know who's running shit now or who would let them get close. It's unfortunate that I'm, I, I, I'm cool with, like, you know, Leo Cohen or Jimmy Iovine. Like, I did all that back then. Everybody's old as fuck and rich as fuck, and it's kind of hard to touch them. But you should f- try to figure out who's the next in line that's, like, hungry and going to be the next Chris Lighty or, you know, Russell Simmons. Like, I'll go Russell Simmons right now. You know what I'm saying? But you need to find these kind of guys so that then they'll give you uh, the reality of, of the business because you can't go in because, you know, back then hip-hop – People were more into the popularity, but not the money aspect. Now is like you could get you have an opportunity to have both. You get your popularity, and you can start touring from your shit. So find some artists. One of them got to blow. Just get three, four artists. I mean, that's that 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 should help me a lot, you know, because you need that connection. Because the DJ shit is a generic. It's a generic. Uh, you know, it's like a generic like title, like DJ. So I. That's why I took my name off and then I went to radio where it's just who kid. Like who kid is with this guy, who kid. You got people gotta see you doing twenty different things and, and don't be tough. Like, you know, be creative. I'm not saying make a fool of yourself, but be open, you know, because you if you're blocked or in a box here in Atlanta or you're in LA, you see like violence, you see some don't be boxed in that world because when I went to Norway, they don't care about jewelry. They don't care. They just, all they care about is the music or whatever you've done and your, and your skills. You know what I'm saying? Like, I tour relentlessly, and I've DJed everywhere. So if you don't know how to read a crowd, too, there's so many whack DJs out there. They just want to jump up and down like the Tiesto. Nigga, read the fucking crowd. If you see nobody's moving, get rid of the song. Point blank is simple. Just got to figure out who you are first before you even become a DJ. Like, how do you want people to see you in the next 10 years? You know what I'm saying? But there's a lot of shit now. Before it was chicka, 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 and then that's cool too. But uh, it's too much now. It's, it's, I mean, I'm one of the top eight mixtape DJs from back in the days, the, the, the originals. So I went through it all. I almost died too. I don't know if you want to deal with that shit. Almost got killed a few times. Uh there is a, uh, it depends on who you, I don't know if you're a 21 Savage DJ, I don't know, but if you, you got you to gotta expect, like, if who you with and just, like, figure it out. If he's, like, a dangerous artist, you just got to, like, roll with the punches or, or quit. I didn't quit. I couldn't leave anyway because 50 Cent's uh, concert was two and a half hours, and then they couldn't, there was no other DJ that could do a two and a half hour show, so it's. I couldn't get out of it. So, but like I said, man, just just be creative, get your fashion up, or, you know, fuck with some bitches or some shit. I don't know. I always had women around me. I mean, if it, you just got and then production wise, producers too. Sorry, add that too. Get cool with a lot of producers. You know, I, I I'm fortunate to know Dre, you know, DJ Premier and all the classic guys. But I also know Metro Boomin. Southside's my boy. You just got to, like, be up to date, you know. I'm an old head, so I got to, like, it's harder for me because I got to understand what's coming up, and I got to think two, three years ahead. And if I think I'm going to quit, like, in three, four years, I got to kill myself in the next three years with what's going on now. So you can watch how I do it, but just do it in your own way. (laughs) 